History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Tune in next week when we'll feature Tom Henderson discussing Mississippi's Prohibition-era black market liquor tax. Always interesting. Today we are delighted to welcome John F. Marzalek III, our first, second generation History is Lunch speaker. His father, John F. Marzalek Jr., has spoken to us multiple times, being greeted with hisses when discussing his book, Reconsidering the Legacy of General William T. Sherman. The truth is there were a few hisses. He was really greeted more by open minds, but... You know, I think the hisses delighted him more than the open minds. John F. Marzalek III is the author of the New University Press of Mississippi book, Coming Out of the Magnolia Closet, Same-Sex Couples in Mississippi. He earned his BA from Canisius College and his MS and PhD at Mississippi State University. He is clinical faculty of the online clinical mental health counseling program at Southern New Hampshire University. Marzalek's research has been published in chapters of edited books and professional counseling journals. Coming out of the Magnolia Closet is his first book. Here is John Marzalek. There we go. Thank you, Chris. And I, I also want to thank the Department of Archives and History and the museums for providing me with an opportunity to talk about my research in my book. Um, before I get started, I wanted to address the elephant in the room. Um, and Chris touched on that just a little bit. But I think many of you thought that you would be seeing my father, Dr. John F. Marzalek, Jr., the historian and executive director of the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library at Mississippi State University. We get confused all the time. You, you wouldn't believe how often it happens because we obviously share the same names. I often receive emails from people asking if I can answer a question about one of his books, um, about Sherman or Grant, and he has gotten calls asking if he's the gay counselor. So you can imagine what a surprise that was to my mother. Um, my father actually is here, but um, virtually on his computer in Starkville, so hey, Dad. Now that I've cleared up any confusion, back to the subject at hand. I'm going to talk to you today about my book, Coming Out of the Magnolia Closet, which is about the lives and experiences of same-sex couples in Mississippi, including mine and my husband's. Specifically, I'm going to talk to you about how the book came about, how I went about doing the research for the book and the couples I met across the state, the major themes that emerged from my conversations with couples, and how these themes compare to those of same-sex couples in other areas in time. So I'll touch on the history a little bit. So to explain how the book came about, I first need to tell you a story. And I have to go back in time to August 2005, and this seems almost um, pertinent now with a hurricane, you know, going, coming through the Gulf right now. So back in August 2005, I was on the faculty at Xavier University in New Orleans, and I thought I'd be there for the foreseeable future. Although I'd spent most of my childhood in Mississippi, I had spent my life after graduate school living in large cities with um, vibrant gay communities. So when Hurricane Katrina threatened New Orleans, I evacuated back to my parents' house in Starkville. What I thought would be a short visit turned into a long-term return to Mississippi. As you can imagine, graduate classes at Xavier um, went online, and the campus tried to recover from a flood that had inundated all the buildings. Um, our students were scattered all across the country at the time. So a friend um, helped me work out a one-year joint appointment with a research center at Mississippi State and Xavier University. And I taught online for Xavier, and I would drive back and forth um, for monthly meetings back at Xavier. Um, and I figured, well, that'll give me a year to decide what I'm going to do, see how the city does. And at the end of the year, I'll probably be going back to New Orleans. But several things happened um, that changed everything for me. So down the road from Starkville in Columbus, Mississippi, I learned that there was a group of gays and lesbians that had a happy hour dinner group that met each week in a restaurant. I started to go and I made some friends and I discovered this old house that I absolutely fell in love with. And you can see a picture of the wraparound porch on it. And um, it was like one of those houses that I had seen in New Orleans in Uptown. Um, and I never could have afforded a house like this on assistant professor's salary. Um, 
And then six months later, I met and fell in love with Larry, um, who's in the picture here. And he's also sitting here in the front row blushing, for those of you that are here and can see him. Um, what I thought would be a year in Mississippi turned into years. And we were eventually married. I settled into life back in Mississippi with Larry, but I still felt torn about whether we should, set, whether we should stay or not. Although Larry's job was there and here, I now had a full-time faculty position with an online program, so we could move if we wanted to. So, compare, um, compared to a state like California or New York, Mississippi, represented by the state's leaders and politicians, does not appear to be hospitable to same-sex couples. The state sodomy law enacted in 1839 continues to be on the books in Mississippi, although the U.S. Supreme Court overturned such laws in Lawrence versus Kansas in 2003. In 2004, uh, Mississippi voters, 86% of voters in fact, approved a constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. Although this amendment is still in the books, the U.S. Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage, as we know, nationally in Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015. Shortly after that, in response, um, in 2016, Mississippi passed House Bill 1523, the so-called Protecting Freedom of Conscience from Government Discrimination Act, and that permitted state officials to refuse to perform same-sex marriage if they had religious objections, and businesses to, to refuse to serve same-sex couples if they had religious objections. Um, Mississippi still does not have, a not, still does not have non-discrimination laws based on sexual orientation for employment and housing. Um, since my book was published, though, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in June that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination in the workplace based on sexual orientation and gender identity, which is a huge step forward. The question going forward is, is this going to apply to housing also? So any protections for Mississippi gays and lesbians are only through the federal law, unless they happen to live in a town like Oxford or Hattiesburg or Jackson, where the cities have passed protections for discrimination based on sexual orientation. So because of all this and the statements I would hear from politicians and religious leaders, I wondered if Larry and I should move to a state that is more hospitable to gay couples. In addition, I often miss being part of a large, vibrant gay community that I had experienced when I lived in New Orleans, and especially down in South Florida, where I lived before New Orleans. On the other hand, as I said before, Larry's job was here. Um, we have family nearby, and we started developing a really close group of friends in the area. So if I felt torn, I wondered what it was like for couples in other areas of the state, especially those living in rural and small town communities. So in particular, I had several questions that led, me want, that led me to want to go out and talk to couples and hear their stories. I think these questions are important um, because most oral histories of gays and lesbians have focused on gays and lesbians living in the cities, especially the cities on the east and west side of the country. And historian John Howard called this the bi-coastal bias. So the literature is focused on the two, two coasts, and then people in the middle, oftentimes people call it flyover country, they become invisible as if they don't exist. Now over the past 20 to 30 years, more scholars like Howard have written about the experiences of gays and lesbians in the south and rural areas, um, books about places like Kentucky, Arkansas, the overall south, but there's still a huge gap in the literature. So, and in addition to this, other oral histories, like I mentioned, have focused on interviews with individuals. So I think my book is unique because it's the first to focus on Mississippi couples. And it follows in the footsteps of John Howard's 1990 book, 1999 book called Men Like That, A Southern Queer History. And in this book, he, focus, he focused on male same-sex desire in Mississippi from 1945 to 1985. And it's, it's really a classic book, if you've never seen it before. Um, I'm going to be citing from Howard's book frequently throughout this talk so that I can provide comparison for you between what I found with the couples I interviewed and what he talks about um, with the um, 
same sex, um, men who had same sex desires, and there's a difference there between identity and desires that I'll talk about later. But to give you some comparison between those two eras. Um, but overall, books like mine and Howard's challenge the myth that, or two myths really, that gay people don't live in the rural South, and that if they do, they don't choose to live there. So let's see. Before I continue, um, it's important for me to kind of just mention some terminology for you that you really gets confused a lot. So in today's world, I know you've heard LGBTQ, and sometimes you'll hear additional letters beyond that, and it can be really confusing. But it's, it's used to represent gays, bisexuals, lesbians, transgender people, queer and questioning, and many others. It's a way to bring everybody under an umbrella into a community, try to be really inclusive. Because all of the couples I interviewed, though, are lesbian, are identified as lesbian or gay, I spend, um, in this talk, I'm going to refer to people as lesbian or gay, and sometimes I'll refer to gay to refer to both, say, um, male and female couples, to refer to a community, because I found that was very common with the um, lesbian couples that I interviewed. Now, Howard also used queer to refer to the men in his book who had same-sex desires and behaviors, but may or may not have connected that with a gay identity. Um, and you have to understand this is a different place in time. You know, in the 1950s, I'm going to be talking about a lot. Today, queer is often used also to refer to anyone in the LGBT community, just an all, just an overall encompassing word to bring everyone together. So, and you know, as an aside, there's some controversy. What some people really like the use of the word queer, and other people you read don't like reading the literature don't like the use. So it's it's an interesting, interesting discussion by itself. So back to the questions I had about the same-sex couples in Mississippi. I identified same-sex couples to interview through word of mouth, um, websites, Facebook groups, and other social media, what's called a snowball sampling approach. And I spoke to around 50 couples, and of those 50 couples, 30 agreed to be formally interviewed in a two-hour you know, interview with a tape recorder. And of those couples, I picked 15 that I thought really represented what I'd heard from all the couples. So as you can see from the map, what I tried to do was interview people in the different areas of the state. And then also, I tried to make sure I interviewed people that represented um, what, the US Census, what the US Census Bureau calls um, micropolitan, metropolitan, or rural. So what they define as um, rural is anything 10,000 or less. Micropolitan are these towns of 10,000 to 50,000 that represent those little hubs like Tupelo, Mississippi is a hub for people for shopping and the medical center. They all come from these surrounding areas, but it's still a, you know, a relatively small town. And the metropolitan is like Jackson, um, 50,000 or above, or the coast or South Haven. So out of the couples, seven to 30, the couples had been in relationships together seven to 30 years. And I intentionally only interviewed couples who had been together at least five years. So I knew that they were in a committed relationship. Demographically, most of the couples were white couples, but I did have two African-American couples, one male and one female, and I also had two interracial couples. Most of the, um, most of the people I interviewed worked in a variety of professions, professional and working class. It was interesting because I didn't have anyone um, express interest in being interviewed who, would, who you would classify as wealthy, or poor. The poor made more sense to me because these are people without resources and they have, more, they have a lot more to lose by people finding out about um, their sexual orientation. But I thought the part about the wealthy was interesting. Um, most have lived through, in Mississippi throughout their lives and almost all of them have lived in Mississippi as long as they've been a couple. A few like me moved back from other places. One couple was originally not from Mississippi and um, I wanted to intentionally interview them because they really gave me a good perspective on what they saw in Mississippi after coming from urban areas like in California. So, and I should just say that as I talk about couples today, and if you read about them in the book, I use pseudonyms to protect their identities um, for reasons I'll talk about as I continue. So, all in all, when I began interviewing couples, I thought that you know, I'll probably have enough material to do a couple articles, maybe do a presentation at a professional conference. And by the time I put all these stories together, and they were so rich and um, just amazing stories, and I brought in my own story, and then I did some analysis, 
it was obvious that it was more than an article and I'd written a book, so you could have surprised me. So let me go to this next section. So in part one of the book, I focus on the relationship of the couples with Mississippi. And you'll see that there are three chapters, communities, families, and religion. And the reason these three parts are these three different topics are included here is because they all relate to one another. Couples' experiences in their communities oftentimes relate to the experiences they've had with their families. And the experiences they've had with their families often relate to the family's religion. So they all overlap. Most of the couples, or many of the couples, live in the same communities as their families. And this, it makes sense that when I would ask them questions about their positive and negative experiences in their communities, they would also discuss their families and churches. And if you think about it, in addition to identifying as gay or lesbian, they're also identifying as members of a family, a community, and oftentimes a church. So their family's acceptance of them as a same-sex couple was related often to their family's religion. So because we only have an hour today, I'm going to focus on the chapter on community. And I obviously say quite a bit more about families and religion in separate chapters of the book. So what did I learn about the couple's experiences in their communities? So there's obviously a difference between tolerance and acceptance. And one of the things I found that really surprised me was that I expected to hear stories about um, discrimination, rejection, harassment, prejudice, probably even violence. And I also hoped, though, that I would hear stories of love and acceptance of communities that welcomed people and viewed them as their neighbors and friends. And I, I did hear stories on both sides of this continuum, from rejection to acceptance. But what really surprised me and what I found was that overall, what I heard were stories of tolerance. And again, tolerance is, is different from acceptance, like I'm going to talk about. So tolerance is not acceptance. In counseling and psychology, we talk about gay and lesbian identity development. And this is the process of somebody becoming aware that they're gay, um, tolerating this idea, and then moving to a place of full acceptance, just similar to this, this um, continuum here. Tolerance is acknowledging that you're different from the majority, but also not really accepting yourself, not, not viewing, in other words, viewing yourself as less than based on these internalized messages, messages you've received from society, um, that being gay is not as worthy as being heterosexual. Acceptance, on the other hand, is acknowledging that you're different from the majority, but that your differences do not make you any less worthwhile, that um, oftentimes when people come to this place, there's a pride in being different. You know, you're unique, and that can be exciting. So I think this process can also be applied not only to individual people, but also to other people's reactions to same-sex couples. So in the sense of whether or not families, neighbors, and friends truly accept same-sex couples, or just simply tolerate them. At a broader level, then, I believe it can be applied to communities. So um, how does this apply to communities in Mississippi? John Howard, who I mentioned earlier, wrote about a social compact of silence in Mississippi. And he was talking about, in particular, the Mississippi before the Civil Rights Movement. Howard argued that same-sex desire, whether or not connected to a gay identity, had always existed. And the evidence he gives, which makes a lot of sense to me, is that if you look back, the state had a sodomy law as far back as 1839. So obviously the state knew that there were people with the same-sex desires. However, he says, for the most part, the citizens of Mississippi and the politicians and even church leaders chose to ignore it. He said the social compact of silence was that Mississippians ignored, quote, expressions of queer sexuality all around them, and queer Mississippians, for their part, maintained low, maintained low profiles. Excuse me. This all changed during the Civil Rights Movement when Howard said that queer people were viewed as outsiders, connected, being connected with the civil rights workers, um, who many Mississippians view, viewed as threatening the social order. And what's really interesting about that is he, he talks about, um, and again, it's a really classic book, he talks about 
that in other areas of the country, it was during the MacArthur era that, that place people really started noticing that there were same-sex desires, men who engaged in same-sex behavior, especially men, um, that they focused on, and that they started really going out of their way to arrest people and, and try to stop this behavior. But Mississippi really didn't change until the Civil Rights Movement. Now, today is obviously different from the 1950s, for example, in Mississippi. Um, today, same-sex couples can be legally married. Um, more, they were more visible than ever before. There have been pride parades in Jackson and Starkville and Oxford and Hattiesburg and a few other places. There's a, um, Mississippi has a human rights campaign um, representative here in Jackson. The universities have... Um, Major universities have non-discrimination policies, and they have student groups and faculty support groups in some cases. And then there are also federal rights that I've mentioned. But as I listened to the couple stories of the couples I interviewed today, I realized that couples were describing a version of this social compact of silence that is, that is along the lines of, we the family or community will tolerate you if you don't act too gay and you don't ask us to acknowledge it. I heard this theme of like a push and a pull for couples in which they would try to work to fit into their rural and their small town communities, but also they tried to maintain their gay and lesbian identities. They tried to find this balance between those two identities, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So when you think about somebody's identity, how they define themselves, it's usually not one-dimensional. For example, I'm a gay white male, I'm married, I'm a brother, I'm a son, I'm a college professor and an author. I consider myself to be spiritual. And of course, I'm a Mississippian and a citizen of Starkville. Depending on the person, of course, you might identify other aspects of your identity that stand out, such as I know we have a rebel here, we have a bulldog, and we may have a golden eagle here too. So um, we all identify in different aspects of our lives that are important to us. Now you see here I have sexual orientation in the middle. So in the next slide, you see I've moved citizen of a community and state because at different times, one aspect of your identity can take center stage, depending on what the situation is or the place that you're in. For the couples who are not white, they described experiencing prejudice and stigmatization based on not only their sexual orientation or their race, but sometimes both. Gays and lesbians who have other minority statuses such as race, ethnicity, or even gender may be considered double or even triple minorities. One of the African-American women I interviewed told me that she believes she has been passed up for promotions because of her, her minority status. Um, she said to me, and I'm quoting here, a lady at my job said, you need to be training the others because you work circles around them men you work with. I said, well, I have to. You know, I just can't go out here and just do whatever. I have to exceed the expectations because number one, I'm a female. Number two, I'm black. And number three, oh my gosh, I'm gay. So her experiences fit in with those of other LGBTQ people of color nationwide who are twice as likely as white LGBTQ people, and that's a mouthful, to report discrimination by police in and applying for jobs. Now, think back to that social compact of silence that I mentioned. Many of the same-sex couples I interviewed described how they try to balance being true to themselves versus not rocking the boat by being too open about their sexual orientation. Couples said they felt they had to choose between making someone else uncomfortable or feeling uncomfortable themselves. Overall, they described trying to balance being Mississippians, community members, and being true to their identities as gays or lesbians. So I'm going to give you a personal example from the book that actually happens more than you think. And it has, to me, it's, it has some humor to it. So we'll see how it comes across to you all. After Larry and I had been together about a year, we bought matching rings to symbolize our commitment to each other. We decided to wear the rings on our right hands until we could be legally married. When we were finally legally married, we switched the rings to our left hands. One evening, a couple months after our wedding, Larry and I went to see a play at the local community theater. During intermission, I went into the lobby. Standing there was an older couple that had known me when I was in high school and when I was heavily involved in my church. I hadn't seen them in almost 30 years. 
they began to ask me the normal questions that you ask when you see someone after a long time about what I was doing these days and so on. And then the wife noticed my wedding ring and she said, oh, John, you're married now. What's your wife's name? In the brief moment before I responded, I thought of all of the following. I've been wondering when I would get this question. Didn't they know I'm gay? I need to respond honestly, but this is really going to be awkward. Can I get out of this somehow? I hate situations like this. I finally responded, well, actually, his name is Larry. We were just married in Maine over the summer. There was a brief pause that felt like several minutes. I watched the wife's attempt to hide the shock in her face, although I noticed that her mouth was beginning to open as if she wanted to say something, but nothing would come out. Her husband rescued her and asked a few questions about whether they knew Larry or not. We stumbled through some more niceties, and anxious to get away from a tense encounter, I made an excuse to make a quick exit back to my seat where Larry was waiting for me. So hearing the story again to me is humorous today, but I also have the privilege of having a job, family, and support system that accepts Larry and me. Other couples don't have that same privilege. One man told me that he takes his ring off at work because it becomes uncomfortable when customers ask him if he's gotten married. He, he fears if he was honest with them that he'd married a man that they would lose business, and he just said it's easier just to take it off. Um, you know, as I've already said, there are no protections for same-sex couples at the federal level. In other words, more formal rights. In fact, polls have shown that a majority of Americans actually support formal rights for gays and lesbians, that those are the laws and the, the rights to people not to be discriminated and so on, and even um, same-sex marriage. The couples I interviewed believed that their neighbors and communities tolerated them and even viewed them as together in, sense of referring to, in the sense of referring to them as Sam or Marty or Sophie and Faith. And to me, that alone shows that there has been progress since John Howard described 1950s Mississippi. It also demonstrates what research has indicated. If someone knows someone who is gay, they're more likely to be supportive. And most of these couples have roots in their communities. They often have families going back at least a generation. So I think it explains why so many couples said that they thought that people tolerated them because they were not like the, quote, stereotypical gay people portrayed on television and in movies and in, um, by anti-gay organizations. In other words, people already knew them before they even entered into a same-sex relationship. They probably knew them as children. So that challenged the perception that people have about same-sex couples. However, it falls into this kind of category of, well, you know, Sam and Marty are gay, but they're not like the other gays in the cities. They don't shove it in our faces like those people in the cities do. So the, contact, the, the social compact, still evident in Mississippi today, serves as a don't ask, don't tell policy. It's the tolerance but not acceptance environment of people and behavior that are, that are not too gay. So, so what are the behaviors that are too gay? Well, behaviors that fall under informal rights versus the formal rights. In other words, the right to be your express, the, excuse me, the right to be yourself and express yourself as any other person or couple in society would. So acting too gay includes discussing one relationship as romantic, such as calling your partner your husband or wife, showing public displays of affection, and not meeting societal expectations of gender norms. Many couples stated for their part that they are careful not to call attention to themselves, such as by not holding hands in public or openly discussing their significant others as anything other than friends. Some couples describe their fears that if they are openly gay, they could lose their jobs. One woman I talked to was fired when her manager learned that she married another woman. An older couple says that they want to be married, but they're afraid to get married now because they're concerned that if people find out, they could lose their jobs, and they're getting close to retirement. So they, they said, well, I guess we'll just wait till we can retire in a couple years, and then we'll finally get married. Um, the one female couple who were, from, who were not from Mississippi originally said that they had contacted another lesbian couple at a nearby university. And the couple told them, and they contacted them because they wanted to know what's it like for same-sex couples in Mississippi. So this other couple told them that, you know, it's okay as long as you're not too out there and you don't shove it in people's faces. Many couples also said they don't fly the rainbow flag on their houses because 
they did not think that they were the stereotypical gay people portrayed on TV and didn't want other people to think that about them. So as I've said, tolerance, the tolerance that the narr narrators say they receive for not being too gay is not the same as acceptance. In fact, several of the narrators, such as Sophie and Faith, who I just mentioned, they present tolerance as being two-faced. Um, you know, they say that community members say or indicate that they accept them, but then they talk disparagingly about them behind their backs. Just as couples talked about not being overly gay as to make others uncomfortable, they describe heterosexual community members not being open about their true feelings about homosexuality and same-sex relationships in order to avoid an uncomfortable social interaction. A few couples expressed that the tolerance projected by community members can feel comfortable until they realize it's fake. One man, one younger gay man said, I get myself into this bubble where I'm like, oh, everyone loves gay people. Everybody's fine. We're just like everybody else. And then every once in a while, I get that culture shock of someone or something that just, just brings me back. This reoccurring theme of couples describing their heterosexual neighbors as being tolerant but two-faced plays into the stereotype of Southerners being passively aggressive passively aggressively polite. One male couple, Marty and Sam said, and they, these are a couple that live in a rural area and have been together probably around 30 years now. Um, We've been together so long, Marty says, that even straight people who normally might find it bothersome, we didn't flaunt it and I think they thought, oh well, they may be gay, but at least they're making their house look better than it did and you know, so they give you some leeway. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I think maybe it educated some people along the way that say, well, they're not really flamboyant. They're, they just stay to themselves pretty much. They work on the house, and maybe they're not as bad as they're portrayed all the time. You know, we don't have the flag outside, you know, Sam says, referring to a rainbow flag. I mean, we all, we have all sorts of different types of friends. We have every economic group, every political group. It just really doesn't matter. What we do in the bedroom or what we do in this house is nobody's business. I'm sure there's some people that smile in our face, but probably talk to us behind, but probably talk about us behind our backs. But at my age, I could care less. I mean, even if they do at this point, you reach a point in life where we don't have to be worried about that if we're going to lose our jobs or be comfortable enough financially. It's like, okay, if you don't like me, it's not the end of the world. Well, we do know some people that will, you know, smile in our face, and we do know that they talk about us, but I could care less, Sam says, echoing Marty. How do you know, I ask? Because it comes back to us, Sam responds. Yeah, especially if you're in a small community, Marty adds. So on the one hand, from the outside, it can appear that repressing one's gayness, like Sam and Marty here, that repressing one's gayness in public could be related to internalized homophobia. And, and in other words, the negative homophobic and heterosexist messages that people receive from their families, churches, and society as a whole. Many people do from a very young age. And what happens is you hear these messages enough, you take them into yourself, and they can lead to self-hatred and a, really a strong desire to fit into society's definition of what's, quote, normal. On the other hand, not allowing one's, quote, queerness, as one couple termed it, to come out can be what Howard described as a resistance strategy a means to protect oneself from discrimination, verbal or physical assault, and or rejection. One female couple provided an example of this resistance when they said that they avoid the awkwardness of interacting with heterosexuals by living in separate worlds in which they only socialize with their gay friends in their small town. In this way, they can be themselves on the weekends without the pressure of feeling they need to, be, um, they need to hide behind a pretense of heteronormativity. So I've been talking to you about couples' relationships with Mississippi, and now I'm going to switch gears for a few minutes and talk to you about um, couples' relationships with themselves, which is the focus of part two of the book. And in particular, in the book, I talk about how couples met and how they got married. I thought it was important to record the oral history of Mississippi same-sex couples during an important period of the gay rights movement, which is the Ogrebefell versus Hodges Supreme Court decision in 2016 that I mentioned earlier. And like I said in this book, there's a chapter about marriage and the couple's decisions on whether or not to get legally married, the reactions they receive from communities, and so on. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on the chapter about how couples met 
and fell in love because I can talk more about how it compares with the history of Mississippi as described by Howard. And obviously, same-sex marriage was not legal in the 20th century. So I thought it was important to share a couple stories of how they met because it's obviously much more difficult to meet someone who is gay or lesbian in a rural area than it is in a city. In addition, when I interviewed couples in their homes, I could feel their love and commitment to each other as they told me the stories of how they first met, which is common when you talk to couples about the time when they first met. And I wanted readers to get a sense of what I experienced when I was talking with them. So I want you to, if you can, imagine that you're moving to a small town, a, a rural community, and you're single. And you're wondering, how am I going to meet people? So you can imagine that if you're a heterosexual person and people assume that you're heterosexual, you're probably going to get invitations from um, sweet old ladies to come to their house for teas or coffees. You're going to, in more seriousness though, you're going to probably be invited to the church and you're going to be introduced to single women or single men, as the case may be, in the church. But imagine if you are a gay or lesbian person moving to a new town and you're single. It would be a rare occurrence for somebody to come up to you and say, I just wanted to check in with you about your gender preference. Would you prefer to date a man or a woman? I mean, it's just, you know, the odds of that happening are pretty slim. We're still years away from a society, in the rural South anyway, in which gay people feel safe to be fully out in their communities and in which community members actively seek to help them find potential friends and partners. So if you think about this, the normal struggle that anybody goes through in trying to find someone for a relationship is compounded for gay people, especially those people living in these small towns and rural communities. I mean, when I lived in South Florida, down in Wilton Manors, Wilton Manors is a small little area of Fort Lauderdale um, that is known as um, the, quote, the gayborhood of South Florida. There's a, the city council actually has a majority representation of gays and lesbians, and they have a gay mayor. So I could literally walk from my house to the gay bars, the coffee shops, the community center, and the gym to meet people all the time. And in fact, I could literally walk down the street and bump into people, and they were likely to be gay or lesbian. And if I did want to go on a date, I could pick restaurants where it would be stranger to see a heterosexual couple than a gay couple. So it's a much different situation for people in these big urban areas like that than it is for somebody who's living in a small town. I think that for people who live in these small towns and rural areas, they have a resourcefulness and a courage that is different for most heterosexuals and most gay people living in these, these big urban areas. It requires finding or constructing places to meet others like them and acknowledging to other people, at least other people that are gay, that they're gay. I mean, obviously, the more people that you're out to, the more people are likely to introduce you to other people like you. However, as I've discussed earlier, being out carries risks, um, including you know, the jobs and housing and all sorts of things, rejection from families, and always the fear of violence, um, which happens, unfortunately, sometimes. So since there are obviously not gay bars or community centers in most rural areas, connecting with others requires accessing what Howard called queer spaces. <clears throat> in other words, spaces created when two or more gay people meet. So let me just get a sip of water. Queer people, queer spaces are constructed to provide safe spaces for gay people to be themselves and support each other, away from the pressure they, they feel all the time in society. So you can imagine how exhausting it can be for gays and lesbians, especially those living in these small towns where they feel like they constantly have to censor themselves and they fear that if I let my guard down, there could be you know, really bad ramifications. It's, it goes back to what I told you Faith and Sophie said about you know, they go to work during the week and they, they leave these two lives and on the weekends, they're with their gay and lesbian friends or the allies they have um, who they know they can be themselves with. So a queer space is can be an institution like a gay bar or a bookstore in an urban area, or it can be something that's created in the moment, like Sophie and Faith having friends over to the house. It can be an impromptu meeting between two friends, um, or more commonly, a planned gathering such as a party. <coughs> of course, in today's world, people increasingly meet on the internet. Um, but I'm going to focus today on, for a few minutes, on parties, because there's a well-documented history dating back to the 1920s of the importance of parties for gays and lesbians across the country. And, you know, parties to help people meet each other, to develop a community when few or no other social institutions for gay people existed. 
Gay people, gay parties afforded gays and lesbians a place to congregate outside the public eye, created this queer space where they could be themselves. But, you know, obviously, um, in the, from the 20s on to, I would imagine, at least the early 70s or end of the 60s, it wasn't necessarily safe because if neighbors said these gay people are having a party or if the police happened to be going by, people could be arrested and put in jail because they were um, gay or lesbian. And that there are documented cases of this happening in the South also. Um, gay parties of today in Mississippi are similar to the gay parties in the past in that people still commute huge distances to go to these parties. And it makes sense. Any rural area, you can't just go down the street to the gay bar. So prior to COVID-19, for example, there was a LGBT professional group for Starkville and Mississippi State University. And there would be people that would come from the town, but then you'd have people come from surrounding areas to, to come to this. They come from across the state line in Alabama. They come from the surrounding counties. Um, there was a um, couple years ago, two couples, one gay and one lesbian, hosted a party in the combination gym slash assembly hall of an old school that um, somebody had turned into a, a space for weddings and things outside this small town. So they had this big party in the countryside outside of this town in north central Mississippi, and the party featured a staffed bar, food, dancing, and a drag show on the stage. I mean, it was, it was wild to see. It was like you're in a big city. And people came to the party from Tupelo, Columbus, Starkville, Oxford, and even as far north as Corinth. So it just shows you how people commute and they travel to, to, to meet each other. Okay, let me just... So I'm only describing the larger parties. As you can imagine, there are a lot of smaller parties, friends getting together, like Sophie and Faith, and um, so on. But I want to give you an example of... Um, let me just get another sip of water. I'll give you an example from my personal experience, again, that I also share in the book. And it's how I first met my husband, Larry, at one of these parties. He's blushing again in the front row. <coughs> After I bought my house in Columbus, I wondered how I would meet potential boyfriends. I mean, there were some gay faculty that I knew at my graduate school, Mississippi State University, some 20 minutes away, but it seemed like all of them were either already in a relationship, closeted, or we just didn't click. One of my gay friends described Columbus and the surrounding area as a, quote, donut for single gay middle-aged men. There are the young college students at the nearby universities, and then there are the gay men who are in relationships or are closeted. So left in the middle is this empty space for the few single men. The ones in the middle come and go. In fact, of the gay men I knew who grew up in the area or went to the university, most have moved to a big city in the South, such as Atlanta, Birmingham, you know, Dallas, New Orleans, Memphis. Even Tennessee Williams, the gay playwright who was born in Columbus, only came back to visit. Every week I went to the Columbus Happy Hour group and there are some days it felt like, well, it felt like riding a roller coaster. Some evenings there'd be a large group of people from the surrounding area, a mix of young and old, professional and non-professional, closeted and out of the closet, and I would leave happy, feeling connected to a community and feeling positive about staying in Mississippi. Other evenings I would go and a few people would show up and they would be people with whom I had little in contact, little in um, common with. For example, there was the occasional married man who was closeted but wanted to, as he told his wife, hang out with the boys. Often I found the only thing we all had in common was that we were gay. Although the group met on a Tuesday evening, it met in the back room off the bar of a Mexican restaurant. Tuesdays were slow at the restaurant, but some locals would still come into the bar. Word spread that the gays were meeting there on Tuesdays. It felt like being in a fishbowl with the locals curiously peering into the room as they walked on by. Not surprisingly, people seemed less on guard and were more likely to join the group when people hosted the happy hour at their homes, many driving from the surrounding counties in Alabama. Fred and Ralph, the first gay couple I met in Columbus, held their annual Christmas party for the happy hour group at their house. That evening I saw Larry. I was instantly drawn to him, both emotionally and physically. Wearing a Tommy Hilfiger shirt and Levi's, he was leaning against the kitchen counter. He had dark black hair with sprinkles of gray in the sides and a five o'clock shadow on his face. His brown eyes were kind and genuine. He's blushing again. I began to approach him and then I paused. I had met him as a graduate student 15 years ago at Mississippi State University. Now here he was after all this time. So we immediately clicked and before you knew it, 
um, he had moved into my house, and eventually the house became our house legally, legally, legally and emotionally, and he sold his house to, across the border in Alabama, and we used it to do renovations on this old house in Columbus. So he was another person who was commuting these long distances to come to this party, you know, across the state line. We weren't the only couple that met at one of Fred and Ralph's parties. Two couples who live in the area met at their home. They'd been together by now over 30 years, and when they were legally married, finally, the three of us couples took them out to dinner, and we gave them a plaque for them to hang in their house entitled The Love Shack. So the last chapter in the book is about why couples decide to stay in Mississippi. And as I talked about this balance that people play, it's very similar about why people want to stay in Mississippi. And I don't have the time to go into it in much depth today, but basically what it comes down to is for the younger couples, they want to know that they can, as many said, walk down the street and hold hands and not feel that they're going to be jumped or that they're going to be discriminated against. Of course, that can happen anywhere, but it can be scarier in a small city. Um, they also wanted to be in a place that had a more diverse community, um, more, more job opportunities, more resources. And in fact, this is not just true of younger gay people. I, I think it was back in 2017, the Mississippi College Board released a study that said 40%, I think it was, of, of students that graduated from Mississippi universities eventually went to another state to find employment. Um, and it, the article was a concern because of brain drain, obviously. So that's, that's a big issue for the couples, the younger couples, especially those younger than 50. For the older couples, they still have that conflict between these identities. My, my, my identity is a Mississippian, my identity is a community member, but they also talked about the roots they have in these communities. A place I've lived all my life, I have family members, I have friends, this is what I know, this is my, this is my home. One, one woman said, this land has been in my family for generations. I, this is my home that I've built. You know, how can I just leave all this? But still there are times when I wonder if it would be better off in another place. It was really moving because a lot of the couples also talked about wanting to make a difference. They said, we've seen progress. There's gonna, we want to be here. We want to make a difference for all those younger kids who are coming up in high school right now and coming into college. We want to make this a better place for them. And then another big issue is financial. Obviously, if your job is here, you know, you have a job. But there's also the cost of living. Mississippi has a much lower cost of living than going to a big place like South Florida, um, living in New Orleans or these other places. So that's a consideration for a lot of people. And I had couples telling me that, you know, they thought about moving, but then they looked at the cost of living and they said, you know, we can live much better the way we are right here. So in concluding, I think that what one, one male couple told me really kind of spells out what these couples were saying. And they said that they believe that same-sex couples are activists, doing as much work, if not more, than the activists in the big cities by living here and in being involved in the Mississippi communities. That by doing this, every day, they're educating people that same-sex couples in Mississippi um, are contributing to their communities. They're, they're, um, they're good neighbors and so on. And it tells us that they're working to help Mississippi evolve, even if it, even if it is at a slower pace in other areas of the country. So, and I, I was told by somebody that you should always put a picture of a dog in a slideshow, so. <laughs> so any questions coming in? We do have questions. Um, one was on, uh, what year did you start uh, doing the interviews, and was it hard to get to a point where you could talk about these issues with a tape recorder sitting between you and the, the Oh, people? those are two good questions. I've got to think back when I started, because I started by interviewing couples, and it was almost like a pilot study, because I was interviewing people to get a feel of how I wanted to go. Um, let's see, Ogre Buffel was in 2015, I want to say 2012 or 2013. Um, over the years, I interviewed different couples, yeah. And I, it's probably a pretty good split between before and after Ogre Befell in terms of the, the, the range of when I interviewed couples. I wondered if the tape recorder would be something that would make it difficult for people to, um, to share and to open up. What I found, though, is that these couples, at least the ones that talked to me, they really wanted to have, have their stories heard. 
and they trusted me that I wasn't going to reveal any information about them because um, because I'm a gay man myself. They knew they know I'm in a relationship, and also because um, they knew that I'm a counselor. Uh, and I wasn't going into the meetings with them as as a counselor, but they knew I was a counselor and that I understood confidentiality and that I really stressed that with them. Um, but I think overall, they just really once they started talking about their lives and their stories, I think it um, it was really it felt good for a lot of the couples just to be able to talk about their experiences. And I found a lot of times during these interviews that um, I was enjoying talking to them and we were enjoying sharing our same experiences at times that we would go over the time and I'd have to try to bring us back to what the interview topic was. So it, yeah. was, it was a great experience. We had a question about um, asking if you could talk about some of the similarities between the great migration for African Americans and the exodus of LGBTQ people from Mississippi. That's a great question. Um, I've got to get this, the date straight in my head. At the end of, at, during World War II, there were um, a lot of people who um, identified or later identified as gay and lesbian, that when they came back from the war, they stayed in the big cities that they had been to. And they had been in the armed forces, they'd met other people like them who were gay and lesbian. And they, had, they didn't, you know, a lot of times you don't know if someone else is out there. And so a lot of people stayed in the cities. People that were able to leave um, stayed in these cities and started forming the gay communities in these cities. And then there was another big migration, and gosh, I think it was the 1980s, but I could be wrong about that. Another huge migration where people, people left to go to the big cities. And, and as I say in the book, um, and similar to African Americans leaving, people are leaving because they don't feel safe here. Um, you know, things have slowly started changing, but you can imagine for somebody after World War II, or even going up into, um, well, unfortunately in some cases even today, but uh, you just think about the 50s and the 60s, it wouldn't be safe necessarily to come out to your family or come out in a community. Um, and it was against, it was against the law. The, the American Psychiatric Association did not declassify homosexuality as a mental disorder until 1973. So prior to that time, you were not only could you be arrested, but you could be you be viewed as somebody who was sick, who was mentally disturbed. So it was a, it was a big it was a big concern. Question here from Diane Williams. She says, "My son and son-in-law are married, and I never shy away from having the conversation, but I do experience harsh words and ridicule. How does your family handle negative comments?" So I imagine negative comments from other people that, that, that Diane talks to. Um, my parents have always been really supportive. Um, and I think it's because I grew, well, my, my father's a college professor and I grew, we grew up in a university town. So I think it was easier than a lot of other communities. But I remember, and I don't think my mom who's listening right now will mind if I share this. I remember when I first came out to her and um, oh, a couple years later, it's a kind of a funny story. So my mom, went to one of the political conventions down, I guess it was like 88, um, I think it was Clinton versus, I um, can't remember, Bush? Clinton versus Bush, would that have been 88? 92. 92, okay, so it must have been 92. And um, she, was coming out of the co she was coming out of the convention and Andy Rooney from one of those shows was, was interviewing people about how do people feel about gays in the military? And my mom happened to be there and so she walks up and um, Andy Rooney, Rooney said, well, how do you feel about gays in the military? And she said, well, obviously I'm for it because I have a gay son. Well, what surprised her when she got, you know, got home is the number of people that had heard this on the TV and the number of people who came up to her and said, I have a gay son, I have a you know, gay daughter. But the other thing she was surprised about was the number of people who acted differently around her. Mm -hmm. Or if she brought this up, would just kind of change the subject. Um, I wish I knew more about Diane's story so I could tell, tell her some stories of people I've talked to, but it's, it's hard to know. But it's, I can just tell you that my mom is always is, is a really feisty woman, if you know her, and she just, she just tells you what she thinks. So. Casey Mosley asks, what religious preferences did most of your interviewees have? How did it impact their feelings toward themselves and their state? Well, if I, if I answer that question, I'm giving away too much in the book, but, <laughs> but no, seriously, um, it, it really is interesting because most of the couples, and this is, 
this is true for research that's been done in this area on, on um, the inter intersection of sexual orientation and religion. Most of the couples came from a um, Protestant religion, um, oftentimes Southern Baptist. Most of the couples who still went, most of the couples either stopped going to church because they didn't feel supported or they found a new church. Um, in Jackson and Hattiesburg, there is the um, MCC church and there are Unitarian churches also in I think Tupelo and I'm guessing Jackson that are very, very supportive of same-sex couples. The other thing I found is in a lot of these small towns, there's no church like that, but couples described feeling welcome in the Episcopal church in their communities. So there were several couples who had previously been, um, had identified as Southern Baptists who had, when they got older and they got married to somebody else, they went to the Episcopal church because they felt more nurtured and felt more um, accepted there. Please. Uh, do you find that uh, some of the couples you interviewed identified with the civil rights movement or what happened to the civil rights movement? Was there a connection there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the question for those of you who couldn't hear is, um, did I find that some of the couples um, really related to the civil rights movement? Were there, were there similarities there? Um, one of the couples I interviewed was a younger black couple, and I, I really enjoyed interviewing them because they, for a couple, many reasons, but one of them was that they were engaged to be married. And I, I remember you know, saying, I've never heard of a gay couple being engaged to be married. This, I mean, I never thought we'd be in the day where someone's engaged and they say they have a fiance, but um, just a really great couple. And one of the young men was a, was a really huge activist in, um, in, his, in his town. And he oftentimes compared what he was trying to fight for, for gay rights, with the civil rights movement. But, um, and so I, you know, he made that connection. Um, and he talked about how um, he really focused on love, that it's all about loving people no matter who they are. I remember other people talking about that they thought it was different because it's easier for gay people to, um, depending on the person, it's easier for you not to let people know what your identity is, but that if you're African American or from another race, it may not be possible to hide who you are, and you face discrimination just by walking in the door before someone even knows anything about you. So people talked about that difference there too. Yeah. We had a question if there are any similar studies being done of other southern states to your book. There is a really good book that's been done. I think it's Mary Gray about around Kentucky and the Appalachian area. There's a book by University of Arkansas Press about Arkansas. Um, there's a really good book called Sweet Tea, The Experiences of um, Black Gay Men, that um, is about black men in the South. Um, I'm trying to think what else. There's another book that recently, I think it was University of Florida Press from the Panhandle of Florida. Those are the ones that stick out right now that I, that I know about. Um, you had mentioned earlier that, that there were no wealthy people, no wealthy couples who had responded to be included in uh, someone had asked if you would talk a little bit about why you think that may be the case. That's a good question. And I, I'm making assumptions, I should say, when I say that, because I didn't ask people to you know, tell me what, how much money they made, um, but just based on where people are living. There are some very upper middle class people, and then I would say there are some lower middle class people and people in the middle. Um, I really don't know. There are a couple people I wanted to interview that, um, that weren't comfortable interviewing with me, and they, they tended to be wealthier and tended to be people in their towns that were well known, and they, were, they just didn't feel safe um, being interviewed. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Or maybe because I'm middle class myself, so I, you know, that, that maybe those are just the people that I, I was able to contact. Um, that's a good question, though. Yeah. 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 Um, John, thank you. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, Check back with us next week when Tom Henderson will give a program. This will be our third one, I think, in conjunction with our uh, exhibit on prohibition in Mississippi that's on the second floor of these museums. Please come and see that as well. Tom Henderson will be talking about Mississippi's black market liquor tax. We have copies of the book for sale here at the Mississippi Museum store. Oh, great. Um, okay. So if you are in need of one of those, contact us about that. Uh, thank you again, John Marzalek. We look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Thank you. I appreciate it, Chris.